Mario Party. The game that has been successfully destroying friendships since the 90s has certainly had its ups and downs over the years, with more recent additions especially feeling as though it's missing that spark that made the previous games so brilliant. It's a franchise that I hold very strongly in the memories of my childhood and for good reason. As a kid, this game franchise couldn't be beat in my eyes, but as I've grown older, I've found myself increasingly dissatisfied with the quality of the newer games. However, I believe there's still a light of hope for the longevity of Mario Party as a series, especially with the reveal of the up-and-coming Mario Party Superstars, which will see the return of some classic boards and minigames remastered. That's why today, we're going to be taking a retrospective look at the rise, fall, and the potential resurgence of Mario Party. Joining me on this journey are my friends, Lewis, Leo, and Jambler. Let's begin. For those that aren't familiar with Mario Party, let me quickly sum up how the majority of the games are played. It's similar to a board game, with a collection of minigames tossed into the mix. The end goal of the game is simple, yet engaging. Collect the most stars by the end of the game, and you win. Stars are placed in designated spots across the board, with one star being on the board at a time. You collect coins from blue spaces, or by doing well in minigames, and can lose coins by landing on red spaces or negative board events. Coins are important as you usually need 20 coins to purchase a star when you reach the star spot. Players can get additional dice or items depending on the version they are playing that can give them abilities such as better rolls, being able to steal coins, swap places with other players, etc. Some items are actually really fucking bullshit, but at the same time keep the game interesting, so I'll give them a pass. Each game has its own gimmick, which adds something extra, usually expanding upon the previous game with a new gameplay mechanic. Mario Party is a combination of skill and luck which to some degree is half the fun. Its random events and easy to pick up and play mechanics make the game inviting to both a long term fan and first player alike. In fact, I like to describe Mario Party as fun bullshit. <laughs> that is to say that the chances of you getting royally screwed over by your friends or a random board event just as you're about to win the game are commonplace. Yeah. Oh, it would be so funny if we had done all that just to get reset. You have to do it, be Leo, you know what's gonna be doing. <laughs> Good roll, <rule>, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> See ya, bro! <laughs> I don't wanna play anymore. But this is exactly what makes Mario Party so addicting. It's competitive nature to do everything in your power to sabotage your friends in the most funny and frustrating ways possible to keep the game interesting. Also, after the amount of times I've been legitimately beaten by the premise of bonus stars, stars that are given at the end of the game for objectives unrelated to the main objective, I would place them firmly into the fun bullshit category. Some noteworthy bonus stars include Most Unlucky, The Red Space Star, and last but not least, The Minigame Star. Whew. Now that's out of the way, let's start by looking at where it all began. The year is 1998. Windows 98 is released and that pesky man Bill Clinton is in the news for all sorts of scandalous endeavours. But overseas from the western world, a company known as Hudson Soft was about to release a game that would become a main staple of Mario for years to come. Mario Party. This game is what I would definitively describe as the foundations of what would follow in its footsteps. There is a lot this game does right, and given this is the first in the series, it's a solid title, so let's talk about it. The graphics for Mario Party 1, like every other Nintendo 64 game, are polygonal, with JPEG-like images for the background. At first, the graphics can seem a little strange in the lens of today. <laughs> What is that? But I do have to say that after a few sessions, not only do the graphics not bother me, but I actually like them. Apart from Donkey Kong's model, those eyes will forever haunt me. As Leo puts it, The graphics of this game could be an eyesore at first, but you get used to it over time and it starts to add to the feel of the game, which makes the Nintendo 64 Mario Party titles stand up from the rest. The main gimmick of Mario Party 1 is what is known as Chance Time. It appears in the rest of the Nintendo 64 titles with a change in the third game, and never appears again after that, being replaced with things like the Reversal of Fortune or Chance Capsules. Chance Time is definitely the most brutal in the first two games, giving random players a chance to steal up to 30 coins or even a star from another player by just hitting some blocks. As our resident Mario Party 1 expert Leo suggests, Thank you Speed. You can time these jumps to get the outcome you want, but it's very dangerous if you mess up. You should go for the middle block first to see who's giving what to who, and then go for any of the other two and aim to get yourself some coins or a star. When you end up with the last block, you basically can't time that. It's way too fast and gives you no time to edit it at all. 
spoken like a true professional there. Chuck Tam was also actually in the third game in a slightly altered form, but I'll talk about that more later. My personal opinion on Chance Time is it's a fun enough addition in a franchise that is just beginning to find its feet. Obviously, they would go on and improve this as time goes on. Overall, Mario Party 1 is a pretty decent game. Nonetheless, I do have some criticisms of the first title in the franchise. For the most part, minigames in Mario Party 1 are relatively enjoyable. There is no denying that. But one reoccurring thing that I notice when playing is that some games are just way too short. No joke, there are a great deal of minigames in this game that can be over in literal seconds. It doesn't matter how enjoyable those games are, if they're over that quickly, it's clearly going to leave you unsatisfied. Minigames in Mario Party 1 feel like a mixed bag, but are mostly positive overall. It struggles in places to find a balance between incredibly addictive and fun minigames, or boring or too short minigames. Luckily, however, they do a much better job at this as the franchise develops. Overall, Mario Party 1 is still a game that holds up today, which is a considerable achievement for any game that came out in the 90s. For the most part, it's the grandfather of Mario Party games. It certainly isn't the best by any stretch of the imagination, however, it spearheads many of the features of Mario Party we would grow to know and love. But there was one thing missing, something that seemed so obvious to be part of Mario Party from the very start that was omitted, and that brings us into the next game in the franchise, Mario Party 2. So what glaringly obvious feature from Mario Party 1 was missing? Items. Well, actually, Web, Mario Party 1 had items. You just had to buy them at the item shop and equip it. Yes, yes, event. technically, Mario Party 1 had items, but it was in a completely different format to every other game in the series. So different, in fact, that it's pretty easy to play the whole of Mario Party 1 without items at all. Mario Party 2, on the other hand, changes that, evolving the overall dynamic in contrast to its predecessor and giving more depth to the gameplay, not only are items on the board present, but they can drastically change the outcome of a match. I'll give you a quick example. Here we have Jumbler, who decides to take a risk and use a warp block on his turn, which is an item that makes you swap places with another player, in an attempt to swap places with Leo and take the star that he is close to. It works, thankfully for Jumbler, complementing his risk for reward play. This is something that simply is not possible in Mario Party 1. Items add a great sense of strategy to the game also. Knowing another player has an item that could potentially flip the game keeps you on your toes to a much greater extent, which I would argue improves the quality of the game, even if it is a little bollocks getting done over by a magic lamp on round 20 out of 20 when you're about to win the game. <laughs> All jokes aside, items are a good addition, and something that was desperately needed for the longevity of Mario Party as we know it today. Mario Party 2 also has quite possibly my favourite gimmick in the franchise, Outfits. I mean, technically, from a gameplay point of view, it isn't my favourite gimmick, but I mean, come on, can you really say you hate Pirate Mario? Didn't think so. The costumes in this game give it a lot of personality. It's a small but a really nice addition to the overall feel of the game. Graphically, the game is fine. It's neither a step up nor a step down from the original. There's not too much to say about it, really. Minigames could be argued as a step up from the first game though, with it seeing a better ratio of good games to bad and the issue of games that felt too short seemingly tackled. Admittedly, some of the games in Mario Party 2 are recycled reskins of previous minigames, but in all honesty, I kind of prefer that over having newer, boring minigames. Minigames do however still struggle with balancing issues, especially in 1v3 minigames, but overall, it's pretty positive. A new mechanic known as the Koopa Bank makes its first appearance, taking a deposit of 5 coins every time you go past it, but here's the catch. If you physically land on that space, you get all of the coins every player has put in the bank up to now. Think along the lines of a bank bonanza from Wii Party. Congratulations to the two people who understood that reference. Hidden blocks are another feature that is added, allowing you to get a star or other cool stuff just by landing on a space that contains it. It is hidden though, hence the name. Love them or hate them, Hidden Blocks adds an element of surprise that can be a game changer near the end of the turns. Oh, I found a Hidden Block. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> this game is amazing. What? A star? Wait, hold on, what? What? Found a, hi found a Hidden I Block, bro. Are you joking? That's pretty much everything there is to say about Mario Party 2. Let's move on to the final game in the N64 era, Mario Party 3. By this stage, Mario Party was really beginning to hit its bread and butter. There aren't a huge amount of changes added between Mario Party 2 and Mario Party 3 other than party mode being changed to Battle Royale 
an addition of a 1v1 duel mode I'll talk about later, and a minigame only mode. Possibly the most significant change between versions is the addition of a story mode, which is essentially the same as a normal board but with some dialogue padding and a minor narrative. It's also single player only, so unfortunately I won't be covering it in any real detail other than telling you. Yep, there it is. There are some new spaces added to boards this time around, which include gambling, where you more than likely lose all of your coins. Wait, did he just lose all of his coins? Oh my god! He did! What? Oh my god! <laughs> Symbolized by a shy guy space. A battle space which takes a given amount of every player's coins and then pits everyone against each other to win the combined total in a battle mini game. Symbolized by a Goomba space. Goomba, fuck you! And finally, an item space which allows you to win an item through either answering a question correctly or completing one of the many item mini games to win yourself some swag. This space is symbolized by a Toad logo, though sometimes Bowser Jr. can show up because he can, I guess. It seems that Hudson Soft were beginning to feel a little ballsy, as aside from the main game, Mario Party 3 saw the introduction of a side mode known as Duel Mode. It's time to do 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 Let's start off by saying Duel Mode is wildly different and separate from the base game. The basic gist of Duel Mode is it is a one-on-one -on -one mini board, where each player has a heart, which has a certain amount of hits it can take. Each character has a default assigned partner, each with different stats. Generally, better partners have higher salary costs, meaning when you can no longer pay the coin salary for the partner, they will just disappear. What are partners used for, you may ask? Well, the objective of the game is to use your own partners to damage your opponents. Depending on the direction in which your partner and your opponent's partner face, you will either attack an exposed opponent or their partner will defend them. You can have a maximum cap of two partners at a time, collected from like a gumball machine mechanism. To win the game, you have to hit your opponent enough times to lose all pieces of their heart. Overall, when me and Leo specifically played Duel Mode, it wasn't the most entertaining thing in the entire world. Though after looking online for other opinions, it seems our opinion is that of the minority. So, I don't know, maybe give it a try if you care for it. That marks the end of the N64 era. Leading us into the next game in the franchise, and what some would consider an upgrade, Mario Party 4. The GameCube era, widely regarded as the golden age for Mario Party, brought with it a plethora of new features to the table, alongside a fresh coat of paint in the style of a major graphical overhaul. Mario Party 4 also sees the first edition of Teams into the mix. Let me tell you, the team mode is a great feature, and I'll give you a rundown on it later. The boards in Mario Party 4 feel very stylized, having just the right amount of detail to feel neither overwhelming nor uncaptivating. Gone are the days of flat looking board backgrounds, replaced by vibrant semi-animated board backgrounds in in turn giving the game a lot of personality. One of my favourite boards on Mario Party 4 comes in the form of... The board Goomba's Greedy Gala, themed around a casino, is probably my favourite overall. The theme of this board is on point. For a start, this board gimmick, being that of a roulette spinner to decide the section of the board you travel to, feels wholly appropriate, with each player needing a little bit of luck to land in the same section of the star. Board events are also largely dependent on fundamentals and gambling, with slot machines to win coins and a dice roll event which can see you sent back to the start should you roll to no a number. Furthermore, the background of this board is made up of stacks of coins and neon signs which really adds to the theme. Other maps such as Toad's Midway Madness give the feel of an amusement park with parts of the board being the tracks of a roller coaster, which is a nice touch. Item spaces once again make a return, but this time in the form of a big or small box pick, which honestly is more than a little underwhelming, in contrast to the more exciting or engaging ways of receiving items in the previous two versions with item minigames. Mario Party 4 decides to ditch all of that. The only positive that could be said of this is its slightly improved spacing. Worse still, the only two items you can bag from one of these boxes is a Mega Mushroom, allowing you to roll two dice in one turn, or a Mini Mushroom, which turns you smaller in size, allowing you to travel under board barriers to access otherwise inaccessible areas. However, both of these items are incredibly situational in the grand scheme of things. For a start, having both of these items active means you automatically miss board events, so say goodbye to any hopes of sniping a star that way. And good luck actually rolling a number high enough to get under the barrier, as a Mini Mushroom only rolls up to a measly 5, meaning unless you're dead close to the barrier, you're probably gonna under-roll, and congratulations, you just wasted your item. Minigames in Mario Party 4 I actually found myself really enjoying. This is probably the first Mario Party that doesn't struggle with minigame balancing issues, even 1v3 for the most part do feel fair to some extent. The majority of these minigames also feel considerably more engaging to play, especially most 2v2s, seeing great minigames such as Dungeon Duos, Okay, okay, this is our chance. 
Are you Why? fucking serious? Why? <laughs> as well as order up and cliffhangers. I hold on to your life right now. Oh, <laughs> we drive through. To name a few. Story mode makes another return, allowing you to unlock another board for completing the entire thing. However, it's time to talk about the best feature added in a very long time. Teams. Teams as a concept is something that you'd really expect as a feature that would have been there from the start. Still, better late than never. At first glance, a team mode really doesn't seem all that significant, but let me tell you, it certainly is. So why is that? Well, team mode introduces a very interesting mechanic, and that is item sharing, meaning that any items you are holding can be shared with your teammate on their turn, which in turn adds a level of tact to the game that the everyman for themselves mode lacks. Moves become a lot more strategic when you have to consider the item capabilities of two players who are working together. So be prepared to constantly be swapping places with others and always have a magic lamp at hand to turn the game in your team's favour. You often get paired into 2v2 minigames which encourage genuine teamwork and are a lot of fun. The only real nitpick with team mode is that you can still get paired in 4 player minigames. With not much alteration nor encouragement of team play, these minigames would often be put down to. I don't care who wins this but... One of us has got to. Which is honestly a bit of a shame. It would have been nice to see some alteration to 4 player minigames, where it could take the combined total of two teams to give an overall team score for that minigame perhaps. But oh well, you can't have everything. The replacement for chance time arrives going by the name of the reversal of fortune space. It's essentially the same idea but themed slightly differently, only this time instead of hitting three spinning blocks, all the decisions are made by a pinball machine. Also, the stakes have been raised as concepts like coin swaps and the dreaded two-star swap is introduced into the mix. Let me tell you, Reversal Fortune can absolutely derail the course of a game, as demonstrated on the final turn of our team mode game. Oh my god, oh my god! No Shit. way! No way! <laughs> here we go! Here we go! Right, okay. It could this... come over though. Yeah, it, it could, but at the end of the day we're gonna lose anyway if we don't do it, so it's gotta be done. Right, let's go. Reversal of fortune. Shit. Right, let's find out. Okay, oh Jacob, you just have to make sure. Don't worry about it. Don't I'm worry about it. Right now. I'm pissing right now. Don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't worry, right, don't worry. I need... Okay, alright, okay, okay, Louis. Don't try not Three to get it to land on me. That's uh Yep. Donkey Kong. No, we, don't, hang on, we don't know that it could go to them, so we've got to be careful yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you can judge you can judge it. If it's to me, that Right, cool. get it to Yoshi. Wait, I've Oh, in it. Oh. Oh, oh my god, oh my yeah. god. <laughs> oh yeah. no. This could be a star. This could be a this star. Could, this could be a star or it, it could, could be, be coin. Star. Yeah, Jacob, it could be the please. You a star. Please, I believe. Right, I, need, I believe, I Jacob. Oh my god, oh my god. That's no, no way. way. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no you way. fucking legend, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. You won. Fucking madman! <laughs> I fucking love Mario Party! And that wraps up Mario Party 4, as we decide to move into the next game in the franchise, Mario Party 5. Mario Party 5 in itself is less of a standout than the transition of 3 to 4. It's about the same as 4 in content though, adding additional GUI changes to how teams are handled, giving them names, and actually displaying on a board that yes, this is a team game. Three new characters are added to the selection of player characters, these are Boo, Toad and Baby Bowser, but let's just call him Bowser Jr for the sake of this video. Unfortunately for Donkey Kong fans, he's removed as a player character from this version and we won't see him for a long while. <laughs> you just want to get his own spot on the board, known as the DK space. The DK space works as a lucky space that is randomly chosen at the start of the board. If you're fortunate enough to land on it, then you will get one of three DK events. These can be either the DK bonus, the DK minigame, and the best outcome, the DK roulette. Controversially, Mario Party 5 completely changed how items are handled with its new system known as capsules. Capsules are essentially the same as items, except it's completely random which capsule you'll end up with. There is no such thing as an item shop in Mario Party 5, so you can't just buy a continuous supply of the most OP items and win the game that way. Which is something? The only way to get capsules is through the capsule container, which is like a literal gumball machine that will dispense anything from god tier capsule to literal useless garbage. Ooh, what am I gonna get? I hope I get something really good. Oh! Capsules are also really dumb, because although you can use them, you have to pay in actual coins. You can place capsules down on board spaces which if other players or yourself land on will act the same as if you paid for that item to be used on yourself. Honestly, 
Capsules are pretty bad. Capsules are fairly uninteresting as far as usage actually goes, only seeing very few actually be genuinely interesting to use or helpful in any way. Most capsules will only go as far as to steal coins from other players with only one rare chance of getting a capsule which will cost you 20 coins to take you to the star and then still have the audacity to make you pay an additional 20 coins for the star itself. And worse still, there is a capsule so incredibly powerful and rare in nature that if you get three versions of it in the same game, the player in first will be forced to give every single one of their stars to the player who holds all three of these powerful miracle capsules. What the actual hell? Yeah. Capsules were not a popular addition, and much of the Mario Party community resents them, with many viewing them as one of the most unbalanced mechanics in Mario Party, and honestly, I can see why. With Mario Party 5 probably being my least favourite Mario Party out of all the ones we've covered so far. Well Jacob, don't you think that's a little judgmental? I mean, surely the game overall isn't that bad. No. Mario Party 5 somehow manages to actually go backwards in regards to minigames. Remember how I praised Mario Party 4 for having minigames that felt incredibly balanced? Did they fuck it up by any chance? Yes. Mario Party 5 has the most unfair, unbalanced minigames I have seen in a Mario Party. I remember playing a minigame where the entire minigame was pre-decided, and no, I don't mean certain elements were pre-decided like what is in what you choose. You had one lever that you were assigned to. You couldn't change it, you just had to twist it and see whatever the hell you got. How is this good game design? Every minigames are okay, but it's hard to look past the clear balancing issues this presents. Super Duel Mode is introduced in 5, and it's completely different to Duel Mode. Yeah, they did a complete 180 on themselves with Super Duel Mode. The only real way to describe it is, it's like mech fighting crossed with Robot Wars. Each player can create their own battle vehicle using the points earned by playing minigames while in party mode, which is a smart move on Hudson Sauce's part, providing incentive to play the game a lot in return for better parts. Different parts of the vehicle can be purchased for different types of points like battle points, minigame points, etc. You can put them together and create your own incredibly cursed creation. Do like I like summer. how this looks? Not in the slightest! The game mode itself is fine. It, it's nothing too spectacular. You fight each other in these machines. The only real letdown is there's a timer that is incredibly short, meaning that most games actually end in a draw, which is really boring. I, I really don't understand why they didn't choose to omit the timer, and as a result, I feel Super Doom World itself is severely omitted by this fact. Mario Party 5 marks the halfway point for the franchise and the midpoint for this video. So, let's reflect. Mario Party added the foundational features that the series will be grounded upon. Mario Party 2 introduces the concept of items. Mario Party 3 increases the item cap to 3 and adds additional game modes like Duel Mode, and Mario Party 4 of course adds teams into the free, with Mario Party 5 seeing the introduction of capsules. Moving over to the next game, Mario Party 6. Mario Party 6 may just well be one of my favourite Mario Parties that prior to making this video I hadn't already played, and I think this comes down to a couple of reasons. Now reason number one I probably have to say is board variety, so what exactly do I mean by this? Well, for one, a great deal of boards in Mario Party 6 have their own unique take on how collecting a star works, as well as including two boards that keep the traditional format. I like to think of this as a best of both worlds kind of deal, on top of this, Mario Party 6 also has one of the more interesting gimmicks in the form of the day and night mode. The characters Brighton and Twyla are representations of the sun and the moon. They also host the parties for Mario and his friends. On top of playing a role in the game's story mode, each of them play a role on the various boards. Every three turns, the board will change time of day, which will affect the board in different ways. For example, certain board events may only be available at night and vice versa. Furthermore, Bowser spaces will be replaced by DK spaces during the day. In this video in particular, I'll illustrate the unique mechanics of two of the six boards and explain why they revitalise the structure of the game. These boards are Fair Square and Castaway Bay. But before we get into the boards, let's talk about new additions and changes. The sixth edition in the franchise sees one new playable character added to the mix in the form of Toadette. In addition to this, capsules, or should I say orbs in this version, are greatly improved in contrast to its predecessor, likely due to the fact that instead of these orbs being randomly given, you get the return of the item shop. Meaning that you have the choice of buying some actually useful stuff. On top of this, there are some more varied orbs than in Mario Party 5, such as the Flump Orb, the Piranha Plant Orb, or the Klepto Orb, as well as the Sluggish Shroom Orb, all which enhance the experience of the game to a greater extent than items that feel more generic in purpose, such as taking coins, or something a little less interesting than that, which I think was my main gripe with Mario Party 5's capsules. Okay, board time. 
As I mentioned earlier, the board Fair Square has a really cool mechanic for the stars. Traditionally in Mario Party, the star will always cost a set amount of 20 coins, and it will move to a different location on the board once bought. However, on this very specific board, this is not the case in either respect. The star in this case is always located at the centre of the map, where it can be visited and circled round in around 20 spaces. During the day, it will consistently cost 20 coins to be bought from Brighton. However, during the night, it will cost you either a higher amount or a lower amount, all down to the value decided when the night first begins. It's a little bit of a gamble, really. When you pay a consistent amount during the day, or take a risk and hope that the price is cheaper during the night, this decision can be detrimental to how the game progresses, as this particular board allows you to buy as many as 5 stars at once, meaning you can greatly save the amount you pay for these stars if you buy them at a time where the star price is reduced. Honestly, I really like this board a lot, though I have to admit that there is a pretty strong tendency to stay directly around the middle of the board, though I guess this comes with the territory. Nonetheless, it's a fun map. The second map I want to talk about is Castaway Bay. This map is also unique in a sense because the star is in a static position. It's always at the end of the map, a trend other Mario Party maps would go on to introduce in future installments. Once you reach the star, you will be sent back to the star to reach there. I think this is a pretty cool notion and returns a little bit of skill to the game. I mean, not overly, rules are still completely random. But more what I mean is, a random player can't get lucky by having the star spawn extremely close to them. I also really like the way they implemented the happening space this time around, as should you land on the space, the ships containing the star will swap. Oh, did I forget to mention? There are two ships, one containing Donkey Kong who will give you a star, and the other containing Bowser who will take away a star, or coins if you don't have a star. So you don't always want to be heading towards the boats, it's all a measure of timing and luck. The day and night mode isn't quite as interesting on this board, but at night a ghost house becomes available, allowing players to steal coins or a star, and trust me, it happened a hell of a lot to me. Bouncing is also considerably fixed in regards to minigames. Oh, you love to see it. You do indeed. I'd probably place it around here on the balance meter. The minigames are also up there with Mario Party 4's collection, which as you know I have a favourable opinion of. Once again, most of the two-player minigames are genuinely top tier, and very fun to play, and from an overall stance, four-player minigames feel a lot more engaging in terms of gameplay, with a lot of hands-on minigames. 1v3s can be a bit iffy, but it's always been a little like that in this series. If I had to say, I think my favourite minigames in Mario Party 6 were Lift Leapers, Clean Team, and probably my favourite out of my favourites, Jump the Gun. And that's my summary for Mario Party 6, which I can give a firm thumbs up and a recommendation to play this game. It's really good. Only one more title on the GameCube remains. Mario Party 7. Mario Party 7 is widely accepted as one of the stronger additions to the series, so does it live up to its reputation? Yeah, well yeah, it kinda does. Is it as good as 6? I wouldn't personally say so, but there are certainly elements of 7 that are leagues above previous entries. Like just wow, some of these ideas are really good, and it's kinda surprising that they don't carry over into future installments. I'll talk about some of these ideas that I'm talking about soon, but first let's talk about additions and changes. Seven's gimmick of sorts is that it's set as a cruise, and each of the boards are different locations of the cruise, which an angry Bowser has then gone and ruined. I really like the idea of each of the boards being different cruise locations, it kinda gives each board a real reason for existing. What I would've really have loved to have seen is one of the boards being the cruise liner itself though, which unfortunately never happens. Speaking of boards, Mario Party 7 features a grand total of 6, seeing the inclusion of two new characters through Dry Bones and Birdo, which can be purchased using cruise points, points that are awarded at the end of each party. In each of the boards, over the course of six turns, Bowser's Rage Meter will fill up, until eventually it will complete activating Bowser Time, an event where Bowser will usually end up stealing around 10 to 20 coins from each player. This event is inevitable, so it's a good idea to stock up on coins before Bowser Time arrives. On top of this, various Koopa Kid spaces exist on the board that when landed on will have small consequences, with the most common usually being player positions changing. Over the course of the game, more are added by players collecting Koopa Kid orbs on the board. Remember the odd fact that the GameCube had a mic? Well, it gets used in Mario Party 7 through the use of mic minigames. Mic minigames are essentially a spot on the board that when landed on, you play a mic minigame involving all the players, usually incorporating inputs such as blowing or alternatively shouting into the mic. There isn't too much to say, it's just a bit of a strange but kind of charming addition. 7 technically also has an 8 player mode, yeah, you heard me right there. Essentially the idea behind this is 4 teams of 2 share one controller each on the board, and honestly it's pretty cool. We've specially designed 8 player minigames to accompany the 
mode, it feels like it really belongs in Mario Party. On a real though, who seriously has seven friends who actually want to play Mario Party? It's been hard enough forcing, I mean persuading, the three people who have played through the games with me for these videos. The boards we'll be looking at today are Pagoda Peak and Neon Heights. First, let's take a look at Pagoda Peak. The method for gaining the star on this map is pretty simple in premise, but makes for an engaging enough game. The star will start off costing only 10 coins. Upon a player reaching the great Master Cooper in the dojo, he will give the player the star and raise the price by 10 for that next person to reach the top. This will continue until the star is 40 coins, after which it will reset back to its default 10. Star price can also be changed at any time by landing on the happening space, which will randomly choose the new price for the star at the peak. Now, okay, this all sounds good, but I have some major, major gripes with this map as a whole. Like, who in their right mind would put three dual spaces together right at the start of the map? I cannot begin to tell you how many times in the space of one game we landed on one of these dual spaces, and let me tell you, it takes a toll on your mental. I want to cry. <laughs> Why? Why is that? Well, maybe because every time you land on the dual space, you're forced to sit through a 2-3 to three minute collection of a cutscene and a minigame, usually for a pretty underwhelming reward, then times this experience by about a good 10, and it gets old pretty fast. In fact, by the end of the game, we were practically working together just to avoid landing on these spaces. Partner this with the fact that there was a quite frankly disgusting amount of Koopa Kid spaces on the board, and we were experiencing an event an average of two times per turn, if not more. This made the board drag, and as a result, I came out feeling more burnt out than anything else. On the complete opposite foot, Neon Heights board was perhaps my most refreshing Mario Party experience since 4, and this comes down to a major change to teams. Instead of each player rolling individually, the dice is split into two, with you and your teammate rolling each dice and then both travelling the combined total of that roll. Each dice can roll between 1 and 5, so the highest roll you can get is still 10, just like in solo play, but what this does is tremendously improve the pacing. But before I continue on the topic of team mode, I'll lay out the star method for Neon Heights. Three chests are placed around the board, each chest costs just 10 coins to open, but only one will contain the star, with the other two either a generous helping of coins, or a bomb on that will send you back to the star start of the board. Admittedly, it's complete look, which some people may look down upon, however, I think this is what makes Neon Heights an entertaining board. There's always a level of tension before a chest is opened, with the people opening the chest praying it's the star, and the opposition hoping to god that it isn't. Please, 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 we have to pray. We have to pray. It's not going to be a star. 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 Don't even worry about it. No! I like the minigames in Mario Party 7, much like 4 and 6. They are very well balanced, and that's always something you like to see. I do, however, believe that for whatever reason, 7's minigames aren't quite as memorable as 6's for me, but I do remember having a good time with them nonetheless. One minigame that does stand out to me, however, is Picture This, where each player has to scroll through a picture book looking for the exact pages shown. It doesn't sound all that engaging, but against other players, it becomes quite frantic and fun. DK minigames are introduced kind of. The, the DK space basically becomes the DK minigame space, there's no roulette or bonus anymore. But I have to say that the DK minigames were actually pretty fun. It's usually pretty easy to beat DK in minigames like Jumpman and Vine Country, but also proved pretty challenging for my smooth brain to win on games like A Bridge Too Short. Hey, speed. <laughs> oh, oh, no, oh Donkey Kong! <laughs> no! <laughs> 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 Finally, the punishment for landing on the Bowser space comes in the form of a Bowser minigame, either single player or multiplayer. There's no reward for completing a Bowser minigame, however failing to complete them usually leads to a negative consequence, such as losing all your coins or a star. From my observation, single player Bowser minigames seem significantly less challenging than multiplayer minigames, with the player rarely losing. On the other hand, multiplayer minigames seemed highly weighted for the majority of players to lose, Especially mini games like Thunderwall that had me screaming. And with that, we closed the book on the GameCube era. Overall, this was a pretty good era for Mario Party. It could perhaps even be considered a golden age of sorts. I definitely think Mario Party 7 is a really good game and is definitely up there with 6. I just think 6 just edges ahead as probably my favourite Mario Party on the list. The Wii was a commercial success for Nintendo, and it's also one of my personal favourite consoles to this day, but what are the versions of Mario Party like on this console? Uh, I'm gonna say mixed. Let's talk about Mario Party 8. First off, I want to start off by saying that Mario Party 8 was my first Mario Party, which means I'm actually prone to more than a bit of bias, but 
I'm going to try my best to look at Mario Party 8 without any form of rose-tinted glasses. And even despite it being my first Mario Party, I can't deny that there's still some flaws or unpopular decisions taken by Nintendo <coughs> motion controls. But overall, I still want to say it's a very strong addition to the series, especially in contrast to what would precede it. I'd also like to welcome Ben to the team who will be joining us in place of Leo for the remaining games of the franchise. The setting for Mario Party 8 is, well, a festival of sorts, with the host as MC Ballyhoo. The eighth installment sees the introduction of two new characters through Blooper and Hammerbro. They can be unlocked after spending your points in the bazaar. The graphics of this game definitely look passable. It sort of gives me vibes similar to that of the early PS2 sprites. That's not to say it's a bad thing. In fact, I quite like the Mario Party 8 graphics, but I actually think that the graphics for the GameCube are far superior. It's not even like this is the quality of the graphics of the Wii, because Mario Party 9 also released on the Wii and looks far better than the GameCube and miles better than Mario Party 8. Mario Party 8's main gimmick is that of candies. Candies are basically the replacement for items in this version. I wouldn't say they're too drastically different from a practical standpoint though. In fact, some of the candies are basically past items but with different names such as Twice and Thrice Candy. However, there are a couple unique candies that aren't just carbon copies of previous items in the franchise. Some noteworthy examples include the Weekly Candy, the Blowy Candy, and the Bolo Candy. There's also a candy shop, which again is basically a reskin of the item shop, where you can buy candy for some, quite frankly, extortionate prices. At least if you're in first, because it actually manages to charge you more based on player position. Mario Party 8's most memorable board just has to be Cooper's Tycoon Town. Seriously, whenever I see any mention of Mario Party boards, this board is normally at the front of the pack. So, how well does it hold up? Pretty well, actually. It's definitely one of the more unique boards in the franchise in terms of the star method, with each player having to invest coins into a hotel. The more coins invested into a hotel, the more stars it offers. If you manage to invest into a hotel a greater amount than the leading investor, then you will become the new owner of the hotel taking the stars that were previously gained from that hotel. Star possession feels a lot more fluid because of this, and I think it gives a much more unpredictable feel to the game, as stars can, in theory, be taken away from you at any time. There's also two lucky spaces on the board that can whisk you away to a free star hotel, granting you free whole stars meaning it's really anyone's game. The other boards on Mario Party 8 are good as well. I certainly wouldn't say there is a bad board, but it's only really a close contest between the Koopa board and the Shy Guys Perplex Express. Though, I have to admit, Shy Guys Perplex Express felt as though I remember it being more enjoyable from my childhood days than it really was in truth, whereas I don't feel this is necessarily the case for Koopa's Tycoon Town. The minigames in Mario Party 8 are pretty good. The only issue I sort of have with them is they really, really shoved motion controls down your throat. I can't think of a single minigame that doesn't in some way involve either pointing at the Wii sensor or some other form of motion involving the Wiimote. This isn't an inherently bad thing, but it makes motion minigames feel redundant and less valuable when they do show up, because they're every two seconds. So overall, Mario Party 8 is pretty good. It's one of the more favoured Mario Parties in the eyes of many, but I do feel that while it doesn't do anything wrong, it also doesn't add anything significant enough to differentiate it. Even candies to some extent just feel like a reskin of items, but it's definitely what I would call a good Mario Party. Is it as good as the GameCube era? Hmm, maybe it's better than 5 and on par with 4 but it doesn't come close to Mario Party 6 or 7 in my eyes. While I don't want to spend too long on what I wouldn't directly include as a mainline series game, such as the games on the handhelds or the spin-offs, it feels almost compulsory to at least touch on perhaps the most prolific Mario Party game in the series' history. Mario Party DS. Seriously, Mario Party DS is somewhat of an enigma. Most people may never have heard of any other Mario Party, but will have played or at the very least known of Mario Party DS. The DS version is generally pretty faithful to the traditional console versions, taking the core gameplay and fitting it into a handheld experience. I wouldn't say it has too many wacky gimmicks, apart from maybe hexes. Hexes are a neat little addition that act similar to how capsules in Mario Party 5 work. Think of them as traps on the board that can be placed on players and when landed on, well... Oh my god! Hexes will usually have perks such as stealing stars, coins, or swapping them around. There's also the friend space which gives 5 coins to the player that lands on it and their predecided friend, based on the players on the board at the time. 
Mario Party DS also has a pretty neat story mode. It has normal boards for sure, but after each board is complete, there'll be a mini boss battle mini game, which are pretty fun to play, honestly. The mini games in Mario Party DS are also pretty neat and take full advantage of the handheld setup of the DS, which is really cool to see, with various mini games making use of the stylus feature within the mini game themselves, while actually having the traditional Mario Party formula still stay true within the franchise. Before we move back on to the mainline series, I want to say that the DS has some pretty good side modes such as Step It Up, The Battle Cup, and my personal childhood favourite, Rocket Rascals. The DS marks the final game that Hudson Soft would develop, leaving the series in the hands of a new company, ND Cube. Quick history on ND Cube. After Hudson Soft went bankrupt, many Hudson Soft employees began working at ND Cube, and they would then go on to develop Wii Party as well as the new era Mario Parties, starting with Mario Party 9. Alright, I'm gonna need a strong drink first. Now, by this point, Mario Party is nine games in, with very minimal changes to the formula. So ND Cube decided to completely reinvent how Mario Party is played, and this for me is why Mario Party 9 doesn't work and is arguably one of the worst games in the franchise. Don't worry, I played it so you don't have to. Mario Party 9 makes 5 key mistakes. 9 drops the individual movement around the board by the characters in favour of bunching them together onto a cramped car. What the hell is this? Now, each character takes their turn being the captain of the car, and will roll a six-sided dice to determine how far across the board they will take the car. After this, the captain will swap to the next player, and then they will take their turn. This is mistake number one. The sheer concept of Mario Party absolutely thrives on the notion of competitiveness and beating the other players. The car mechanic does not gel well with this. While it doesn't exactly feel as though you're playing in a team with one another, though it can feel like that at times, it also doesn't feel exactly like you were playing against each other either with the only real versus element being present in the minigames themselves and the final winner reveal. Speaking of the final winner reveal, the game isn't won by a countdown of rounds anymore, it's actually won once you reach the end of one of the boards, which really doesn't take all that long and it feels kind of monotonous over anything else. This is mistake number two. Mistake number three comes in the form of the minigames themselves, but not in the way you traditionally expect, because the minigames in Mario Party 9 are actually not bad at all. Admittedly, they're not as memorable as previous eras, but they certainly aren't bad and they don't really struggle with balancing or anything of the sort. But minigames are so infrequent in themselves that you rarely get to experience them. That's because due to being no rounds anymore, there is no longer a minigame after every round. Meaning that the only way to trigger a minigame is to land on a minigame space or find one in a dice box. Now, this isn't very common at all. In fact, I counted, and in just one game, we only played five minigames. That is abysmal, and not really much of a party. <laughs> Mistake number four is the fact that they removed coins. Entirely. Not only this, but because of the lack of coins, there are no longer blue and red spaces which will either give the player coins or take the coins away. Well, I say that, but these spaces do remain, but they just don't have any impact on the game. They're just null now, acting essentially as a safe space, which is boring. Mistake number five is probably the most egregious out of them all, and essentially buries the hole that Mario Party 9 dug itself. Get ready for this one. <laughs> They removed the star. <laughs> God knows what ND Cube was smoking with this decision, but they decided to opt for mini stars, which act more like coins than anything else, being earned through successful minigame wins, bonus captain events, or between various spaces on the board. The problem is, these are now the deciding factor for who wins the game overall, and it feels more like taking away from the game rather than giving it new life, dumbing down some already well-established features. Not only that, but Mario Party 9 sees a roster reduction of just 12 characters compared to the previous 14, with the removal of Boo, Blooper, Toadette, Hammerbro, and Drybones, who were then replaced by Shy Guy and Magic Cooper. Like, these are fine characters to add, but why remove? So is there anything you actually do like about Mario Party 9? There is one thing. Each board has a checkpoint, which you will then complete a type of boss minigame, similar to those of the DS era, but multiplayer this time. And they are genuinely enjoyable, with players able to earn mini stars based on their performance and factors like the killing blow, with a final themed boss at the end. These are good and old, no doubt, and I think they would have added some freshness if they had just kept the traditional gameplay. Unfortunately, this feature in itself is nowhere near enough to save this game. I like to describe Mario Party 10 as a game full of wasted potential, now why is this? 
Well, Mario Party 10, for the most part, doesn't really improve upon the mistakes it had made previously. In fact, pretty much all of the criticism I had put towards Mario Party 9 can be applied equally to Mario Party 10. And it would almost remain this way had it not been for one saving grace which just sways the game into a slightly more favourable opinion. This is Bowser Party, a mode that I have admittedly already played years ago on this very channel. I swear God, if you get the fish, I'll kill you. This game hit. No, this ain't on! <laughs> <laughs> oh, still still got got play, play. oh my god, look at him! <laughs> he, he can definitely start a star in. He can start 10! This idea is perfect. If there are any game modes that perfectly complemented the car mechanic, it's this. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. What actually is Bowser Party? Bowser Party is a 5 player side mode where one player assumes the role of Bowser and the other 4 players the traditional cast of characters, of which Donkey Kong has made a triumphant return, as well as Toadette and some new arrivals in Rosalina and Spike. As stated before, this is a 5 player game, and I really like the way that the Wii U makes use of the gamepad as a controller for the player playing as Bowser. It's a really cool idea, and one that I find is implemented excellently. Our fifth player who joined us was Lewis's own sister, who for privacy reasons will not appear in any footage. Each player in the car starts off with six lives, with more being able to be earned by progressing across the board. Bowser's main objective is to eliminate all the players by catching up to their car, where he can then initiate a Bowser minigame, where Bowser will try to steal as many hearts as he can and eliminate all the players. If all the players are eliminated, then Bowser wins. On the flip side, if the players reach the final goal and secure the star, then the players in the car win. I, I had a hunch! Oh. I had a hunch! Everyone said the fat guy and I was like, I won, GG. <laughs> GG, boys. Now the reason the car mechanic works so well for this specific mode is because it's team based, so it actually makes a whole lot more sense for the players to be in the car rather than around the board individually. In fact, I'm confident in saying that this mode simply wouldn't work without the car mechanic. Furthermore, the linear finish line also makes perfect sense for this game mode. While it wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to see this working in a round based system, an overall route to a finish just feels more appropriate here. It also helps that the Bowser minigames are super unique in themselves. They're still undoubtedly Mario Party, but a lot of the obstacle or challenge comes from Bowser himself, a human player. This adds a lot more engagement into the minigames and essentially acts as a 1v4 minigame. As Bowser tries to outwit the players that are working together, it's a really good time. These minigames can be punishing though. It's not rare to have what you thought was a plentiful amount of lives, taken away in the space of one Bowser minigame. So they do pose a real risk to getting to the finish. This however is balanced out by the fact that Bowser typically has to get considerably high rolls to catch up to the other players. Think of it like a big game of cat and mouse. Unfortunately, Bowser Party only has a measly three boards, which are already variations of the boards in the normal mode, which is kind of a shame. But I do like how they implement some parts of the board in this mode. For example, on the map Chaos Castle, the player who is Bowser gets to place traps in designated areas that if landed on, will take player's heart, which I like a lot. Yeah, so... Liz is quite smart. So, uh -uh. She, so she, knows ben, she knows Ben will be going for the hearts. No, she doesn't. She thinks Ben's gonna go for the hearts, but she thinks, no, people know that I'm, go I'm gonna put the thing on the hearts. She's better on the other side. Go to the hearts! Can I just survive? <laughs> But my absolute personal favourite map is Whimsical Waters, as Bowser is given the task of tricking the players into picking negative consequences. It essentially becomes one big set of mind games and it's honestly really, really, really fun. I'll give you I'll give you a hint, but it's an obscure hint. Okay, we got a Nora. Yeah. Whoa! Once again, the normal minigames in Mario Party 10 are pretty fun, but in the main game, like Mario Party 9, they don't occur all that frequently, which, again, is a shame. Overall, Mario Party 10 is still not a great game. It would be much worse if it didn't have this lifesaver of a mode, but it isn't enough for it to be classed as a good game in my eyes either. Bowser Party is only a side mode, and while it is very good, if a side mode overshadows the main mode, then that suggests you have a pretty big problem. After the disappointing and lukewarm reception received from Mario Party 9 and 10 respectively, it seemed that the future of Mario Party was becoming an ever-increasing question mark. If there was ever any chance of reviving this series, 
ND Cube's next Mario Party would need to far exceed their previous contributions, and simply put, this seemed optimistic at best. However, when all hope seemed lost, a light of hope came in the form of Super Mario Party, the debut Mario Party for the Switch. This was make or break for Mario Party, one more bad game and the franchise would almost certainly be on its last legs, so without further ado, did Mario Party impress the masses? Yeah, it sort of did. Don't get me wrong, this game is not without its faults, but it is miles better than ND Cube's previous attempts and has some really promising features that seek to differentiate it from previous entries while still keeping the familiarity of the Hudson era. A key difference from Mario Party 9 and 10, which reinvented the formula, but to such an extent it alienated long term fans. For a start, ND Cube finally decided to get rid of the godforsaken cars. This in my opinion was something that really needed addressing, the only true justification for the cars was Bowser Party, which is a shame to not see make a return, but would have been rather difficult to cater to the setup of the Switch. Super Mario Party also has the largest roster of characters in the franchise so far, with new characters Diddy Kong, Pom Pom, Goomba and Monty Mole all making their series debuts, alongside every other character who has ever been in the series previously, apart from a couple of notable exceptions. Super Mario Party boasts a modest 4 boards, which really doesn't seem like all that much, but what I can say from experience is that all of the boards are sufficiently fun to play. Super Mario Party makes two fundamentally important changes to the series. Typically, I would class these as gimmicks, but in this instance they have such an impact on the game itself that it feels almost as if it were an insult to call them a simple gimmick. These changes also brought a great deal of new focus onto an often overlooked and undervalued element of Mario Party. Strategy. You want to know what these changes were? Alright, I'll tell you. Four words. Allies and character dice. I'm going to start off by explaining that rolling the dice in Super Mario Party isn't exactly the same as in previous editions. This is because every character now has their own unique dice that they can choose as well as the default dice. To give you an example of what I mean by this, some characters may have a dice that has a chance of rolling high numbers, but an equally plausible chance of rolling low numbers encouraging a risk for reward playstyle, while others may roll consistent medium range numbers, encouraging a more controlled, less risky approach. And then we just have Shy Guy, whose middle name is Consistency. Wow, would you just look at all them fours? But yeah, that's right, you also saw a zero there in that list. For probably the first time in the Mario Party series, it's possible to roll a literal zero, as well as some characters being able to roll, not spaces to move, but bonuses like coins. It's a really interesting inclusion that genuinely adds a lot of tact to the type of character you choose to play as. They are no longer exactly the same, each character and their dice have their own unique advantages and drawbacks, so it's probably a good idea to experiment and try and figure out which character best suits your playstyle. Pretty shortly into the game, I realised Yoshi is probably not the best character to play for me in this case. His dice just don't feel rewarding enough in many cases compared to other characters. So what are allies? Well, basically, each board has a new type of space called the ally space. When an individual lands on the ally space, then they will be randomly selected an ally out of the assortment of characters unlocked, and not currently on the board. Upon receiving an ally, they will then join you for the rest of the game. They'll be very beneficial for you, as any roll you would normally make will now have the addition of the ally roll paired with it, meaning you can roll some pretty high numbers. You can also have a maximum of 4 allies at one time, and well, if you don't manage to land on any ally spaces at any point in the game, then I hate to tell you this, but you probably ain't winning. Allies are so important to winning the game. If you don't have an ally, it's unlikely you're going to be able to make any high rolls on the board, meaning you're constantly going to be bested to the star by the player with an ally. I would say I like the ally and individual character dice mechanics, as it adds a whole lot more depth to the gameplay as a whole. Fun fact, this is the only mainline Mario Party to not feature the Bowser space, which makes sense given Bowser is a playable character in this one, so the next best thing they had to do was settle for the bad luck space. It essentially works the same way though, and is converted to an extra bad luck space in the final rounds of the game. Extra bad luck. Jacob, why extra bad luck space so we can have a funny clip? Yeah, true. I mean, if it's for content. <laughs> I think that is as well. <laughs> He's actually done it! <laughs> <laughs>
That's amazing. <laughs> the boards in Super Mario Party are fine, I guess. I mean, they aren't particularly my favorites. I personally feel that they're a little too small, and they don't really offer anything drastically unique, almost as if they were trying to play as safe as possible. I did get a little excitement out of bob -omb's mine, as I like the concept of each event space leading to a countdown to a big bob -omb explosion. Mini games in Super Mario Party are especially top tier. They make use of the Switch's high quality rumble feature to add some immersive mini games, while at the same time not crowding the game with mini games filled with the feature. I'm looking at you, Mario Party 8. When they come up, they're a pleasure to play, but they aren't overused, giving more meaning to them when they do show up. The smaller setup of the Joy-Cons actually complements the minigames to a considerable extent also, with buttons doubling as a D-pad. I'd also have to say every minigame I played was considerably balanced and were genuinely engaging to play. A lot of minigames that we played, I was smiling all the way through. Another small but I think really satisfying inclusion is the form of the practice box. Before every minigame, you can quickly learn how the game is played and the controls by playing a mini version of it in the corner, before each player is comfortable. Every player has to ready up for the minigame to start, giving everyone a fair and equal shot. It also avoids a very prevalent issue in many of my previous Mario Party playthroughs, which is people ending or accidentally starting practice mode. There was genuine rage in that, by the way. I do have some pretty major issues with how Super Mario Party initially handles its online modes. For a start, it didn't even allow players to play any of the boards online. In fact, the only mode that was online inclusive was the online Mario-thon that allowed you to get this play only 10 of the 84 minigames included in the game. So that's what mediocrity tastes like. That was until Nintendo out of the blue dropped an online update. Ah! Like, seriously, this was something nobody could have seen coming. Super Mario Party dropped in October of 2018 and finally got a satisfactory online release in April of 2021. That's nearly three years. With this updated online, boards are made fully online and more minigames are added, which is a welcome change to see, it's just strange it took them this long to put the changes out. So, that's it. Every single mainline series Mario Party. Some good, some bad, but all had some level of impact on the series we know today. I'm not going to rank them in order of how good each was, that's something that only you can make your mind up about. I hope you've enjoyed this retrospective dive deep into each Mario Party game released over the years. This truly has taken a long time to research, organise, and most importantly play. So any support such as giving the channel a subscribe and sharing this video with your friends would mean a tremendous amount to me. And of course, links to all the amazing people who have aided in the creation of this video will be down in the description. I highly recommend you check them out, as without them, this video wouldn't be possible. As we look to the future, I see a lot of promising things to come for Mario Party with the release of Superstars. For a start, it seems to come with functional online right out of the bat, which is a hopeful sign. So once again, I'm going to be asking the question, will Mario Party impress the critics and restore some of its former glory in the eyes of the public? Or will it crumble under the pressure? Only time will tell.